So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session about signatures. We have three talks in this session. And um, the first speaker or the first uh, presentation is about locally verifiable signature and key aggregation. This is a joint work of Richard Boyal and Vinod Vaikunda Tanatan. And uh, Richard will give the talk. So Mark, for the introduction, uh, am I a little loud or is that okay? Okay, <laughs> it's a little loud to me. Uh, yeah, so thanks a lot for being here, especially after the rum session. It was a late night and everybody could make it. It's a larger audience than I was expecting, but okay. So today I'm going to tell you more about locally verifiable signatures and key aggregation. So the starting point of this talk is digital signatures, which we need no introduction. They are one of the most basic and fundamental building blocks of cryptography. And basically using digital signatures, we can sign messages digitally such that they cannot be forged. They cannot be faked by anybody else. And they can verify the authenticity of the underlying message. And we, there are tons of applications where digital signatures are used in trying to create uh, certificates or in blockchains for authenticated transactions or for even as simple uh, functionality as trying to visit a web page. We rely on digital signatures. Given the ubiquitous nature of digital signatures and numerous applications, digital signatures have been studied in various different models. One of the most well-known models of digital signatures is also called the aggregate signature model. Aggregate signatures are special types of digital signatures which have one very special property. In addition to generating digital signatures, you can publicly aggregate a bunch of signatures, an unbounded sequence of signatures into one single short signature. That typically means consider a sequence of L messages and signature pairs. If this was an aggregate signature scheme, then you can compress all these L signatures. You can aggregate them into one single short aggregated signature. And the property is that you can verify, you can use this aggregated signature to verify all the L messages, authenticity of all the L messages at the same, thereby reducing the total space requirement on the system. And aggregate signatures have seen tons of applications because they guarantee unforgeability for all signed messages, even after you sort of perform this compression and aggregation step. And the applications range from trying to sort of compress uh, certificate chains or trying to use them in secure BG, uh, uh, BGP route attestations, or even in trying to sort of reduce the footprint of digital component or the cryptographic component on blockchains. And due to the ever-growing nature of the number of applications to aggregate signatures unlocks, it's very interesting that and in how many different new ways we can use aggregate signatures. And although aggregate signatures are like a fantastic object, they have been studied for numerous decades so far. There are many different variants, such as the single message variant, which is also called multi-signatures, the synchronized aggregate signatures, or sequential aggregate signatures. We have multiple different constructions, ranging from different assumptions, such as pairings, factorings, multi-name maps, obfuscation, whatever you like, you can pick that assumption and come up with an appropriate uh, aggregate signature, signature scheme with relevant properties. But given this progress, there is just one big caveat that we face while using aggregate signatures. They're a fascinating object, but they have one big limitation which has not been addressed so far. The problem is the cost of aggregate signatures, it comes at the cost, or just yeah, the, the aggregate signatures comes at the cost of verifying, of having a larger verification time. So the verifier now needs to read the entire list of messages that it needs to verify. So basically consider this example where we have these L messages and signatures pair, and we have this aggregated signature. To verify this aggregated signature, you need the signature, but you also need all the L messages. And it seems kind of intuitive that you need to have all the L messages that you are trying to verify. But it turns out what's happening is that the compression that we're getting in aggregate signatures, that's coming at the cost of a larger verification time. Suppose you only want to verify the authenticity of one particular message out of those L messages in an aggregated signature. You still need to read all the L messages. You still need to run the verification algorithm on all different L messages. And the question that we're interested in this work is, can we basically aggregate signatures without sort of spending as much time to verify? Or more generally, is there a much better space-time trade-off that we can uncover if we sort of revisit the notion of aggregate signatures? So in this, okay, so maybe my pointer is moving a little bit slow. So sorry about that, but yeah, this was supposed to be here right now. Okay, so in this work, what we do is that we study this concept of locally verifiable aggregate signatures, trying to sort of focus in on this problem, trying to fill this gap, which has been left open for the longest time. And to that end, we define these locally verifiable aggregate signatures. And the intuition behind locally verifiable aggregate signatures is as follows, that the local verifier can basically verify an aggregate signature 
just for a single message. It does not read, to, uh, read the entire list of messages. And how could we possibly formalize that? So let's just look again at the example of sign and aggregate. So one possible idea could be, okay, there is a local verification algorithm in which the local verification algorithm just takes this input, an aggregate signature and a single message. And it basically outputs whether the message is a valid message or not as per this aggregate signature. So this is the dream version. It would be wonderful if we can build this because then this gives us not only compression, but also very, very fast verification. And it turns out that if we want a local verification algorithm, which only takes us a single message, then it's quite good, but it's too good to be true. And the reason is that there's a very simple incompressibility argument, which you can show, you can use to show that this is impossible. And the idea is as follows. Suppose there is a sequence of N messages. Messages could be integers one through N. And a certain subset of these messages have been signed and have been aggregated. Now you only have the aggregate signature. And suppose these locally verifiable aggregate signatures only take as input a message, one particular message. So what you can do is that you can potentially sequ uh, sequentially sort of just run through all the possible messages and check whether that particular message verified or not. So depending upon which messages it verified for, you can extract the entire list of messages which have been aggregated. And using this, you can basically recover the entire list from a short signature. The signature does not grow with the number of uh, messages that have been aggregated. So basically sort of just here gives us that there's an incompressibility happening and we can't sort of just build this dream version of locally verifiable aggregate signatures. So it seems like maybe there was no actual, there was actually no gap. Aggregate signature is the best thing that we can hope for. But it turns out that if we sort of just maybe turn the tables a little bit or just think about the problem a little bit different, then there is a way to get the best of both worlds. And our idea in this case, to avoid impossibility, what we're going to design, we're going to give the system a special uh, hint generation algorithm to aid the local verification. So the goal is still to make sure that the local verification is very efficient. It does not grow with the entire list of messages that you have aggregated. But maybe we can sort of just yeah, make sure that there is an possibly inefficient processing algorithm. In that case, you can generate some small hints. And those hints could be used to aid the local uh, verification algorithm. And what that means is we again have this aggregate signature. And now there is a local opening algorithm or a hint generation algorithm. And this algorithm also takes us input, a target message for which you want to generate a short hint and the sequence of all messages. And it basically computes a short hint, which is independent upon the, of the entire list of messages. And now the idea is that you can simply throw away this particular uh, list of messages and just given the target message, uh, the aggregate signature, as well as a short hint, you can sort of just run a special local verification algorithm to efficiently verify that this particular aggregate signature contains is a valid signature for a signature containing the message M. So just trying to formalize a little bit further, the local verification algorithm, it takes its input, this aggregate signature message M and this hint H and tells you whether it's an valid or invalid uh, message. And for security, it's very important that we design these signatures such that, such that we can guarantee unforgeability even when the adversary can control or can generate arbitrary hints because we don't want to rely on who's generating the hint or particular the local verifier because the local verifier doesn't even have the entire time to verify what the messages look like. So the idea is basically that an attacker cannot create an aggregate signature as well as a hint such that it is a valid uh, uh, signature and hint pair for a particular message that was not signed by the challenger. And if you don't sort of satisfy this property, then it's insecure. If you satisfy this property, then you can sort of just yeah, have this best of both worlds. But at this point, you might be thinking, okay, what's really going on? We said that it's kind of impossible, but we designed this local opening algorithm or the local uh, hint generation algorithm that sort of just tried to aid this particular primitive of locally verifiable aggregate signatures. But why is it still interesting? Why can we sort of just still use that in many applications? So let me sort of just here yeah, run through some potential applications where we can actually use the local verification algorithm as we have designed. So consider the example of uh, certificate transparency logs. So certificate transparency is just an internet standard in which we basically have multiple cert certificates just stored by uh, in a certificate log, which, which verify the authenticity of different web pages. So in that case, suppose a web browser needs to access and verify that a particular thing is valid or not. It needs to go to the certificate transparency log. It needs to verify the authenticity. But what happens is that the certificate transparency log is pretty big. 
using aggregate signatures, we can compress the entire footprint, the memory footprint that uh, the log needs to keep. But if we use aggregate signatures, then each verifier, which is simply basically a web browser or a particular small, uh, very uh, low level device, that needs to read the entire list of messages to verify that transparency log. But using locally verifiable aggregate signatures, we can just provide a small hint to, to the verifier. So we can not only reduce the footprint on the server, but you can also provide a short hint using which a verifier can efficiently verify the validity. And we can sort of also sort of just imagine the same to be happening in blockchains. Imagine Alice is a tenant that pays monthly rent to Bob. And Alice sends some money over block or over Bitcoin monthly, or whatever the rent is. But Bob doesn't want to store all these different transactions as different signatures. It wants to store all these, aggregate them together, and store like one single aggregated signature in its particular uh, in, in in its particular wallet. But now what happens is that uh, whenever Bob wants to uh, spend this particular aggregate signature, then it has to sort of provide all the sequence of messages. But using aggregate these local verifiability property, it can just generate a local uh, a hint, a short hint, using which it can spend just one of those particular transactions. It does not need to share all those transactions. And it turns out just having this not only gives us an efficiency gain, but also provides us some type of privacy uh, guarantee, because when you compress this, then the short hint is not going to leak all the information about the remaining transactions. And I can go on and tell you more about applications through redactable signatures, or even sort of just the general time space trade-offs, which locally verifiable aggregate signatures sort of unlock. So here is a table that's also present in the paper, but it basically captures that using locally verifiable aggregate signatures, we can basically cover the entire spread, spread of uh, what was covered by vanilla signatures or aggregate signatures, or just using locally verifiable signatures directly. So we can sort of just create like a very smooth trade-off between the server space, the server time, the per client space, or the per client running time, and how these things can be sort of just here, yeah, depending upon your application, you can choose the appropriate parameters and make the use of this particular smooth trade-off. And I want to emphasize before going forward that all these applications, they still make sense, even if we are working in a single sinus setting. A single sinus setting for aggregate signatures basically says that there is a single party Whose, whose signatures we are trying to verify. And the reason we want to, or we are trying to aggregate, because uh, in, for example, in the case of blockchains, Alice is sending the payment to Bob each month. Alice is the same party. You still want to sort of just accumulate, aggregate all the particular uh, transactions that Alice has performed. So just trying to study this object in the single sinus setting is already very useful because it unlocks even just these interesting applications. Now in the remaining talk, I'm going to sort of just yeah, tell you about the new constructions and feasible results that we obtain about uh, these locally verifiable aggregate signatures. And uh, the constructions that we obtain are, we obtain certain new practical constructions from RSA and uh, pairing based assumptions. And also we get a feasibility result from SNARKs. Although it's not super efficient, it just tells us that uh, the best possible version of uh, locally verifiable aggregate signatures is also possible because the practical construction that we obtain, they are only in the single server setting, whereas the using snarks, we can show that we can achieve this general model of locally verifiable aggregate signatures. The only difference is that in the general model, there could be multiple different users whose signatures you want to ag uh, aggregate and you want to open late at a later point. In a single signer setting, there's a fixed single signer and you want to aggregate signatures and later open just one of them or a few of them efficiently. So next, let me just yeah, tell you for how to actually design these locally verifiable aggregate signatures. And the focus of the remaining talk is going to be on the factoring based signatures in the single signer setting. And towards the end, I'll quickly mention how we can use these ideas and the underlying algebra in a similar way over pairings as well to, to unlock the same uh, potential in uh, for pairings and how they can sort of just potentially be used in snarks also. But if uh, let's just see if we can get to snarks or not today. But uh, yeah, so the starting point of how to design um, using uh, factoring based assumptions, how to design these particular signatures. Let's just revisit the most fundamental object from RSA that we know, which is the classical RSA based signature scheme. And the idea is that the verification key contains an RSA modulus N and an exponent E, a prime exponent E. And a signature on a message M is simply you hash the message and you take the Eth root of the hashed message. To verify, you simply check whether uh, the signature's eth power is the message that you want to verify. That's just revisiting the classical RSA scheme. And 
It turns out, although it has not been formally defined to the best of our knowledge, there is a very simple folklore way of trying to aggregate these particular signatures in the single signer setting. And the idea is very simple. Just multiply all these signatures, and that's going to be an aggregate signature. So suppose you have these signatures H of M1, the, e, the eth root of H of M1, and the eth root of H of ML, and all of these things. And you can just multiply all of them together, and the sigma hat is just going to be the multiplication of all these elements, and that's going to be an aggregate signature. And now to verify this particular aggregate signature, what you can do is that you can raise the aggregate signature sigma hat to the eth power and check whether that equals the product of all the messages that you want to add, that you wish or that you want to check have been aggregated in this particular signature. So, okay, so first step is done. We know how to create single signer aggregate signature schemes from RSA based assumptions. Now the question is that, can we make this to be locally verifiable? So local verifiability, uh, verifiability simply says that first we need to create or we need to understand how we can create these short hints, which will make sure that the local verification can be sped up. So to that end, an idea is very simple that to make sure that they can be locally verified, we can sort of create this as the following hint. Suppose you have these L messages, M1 up till ML, and there's a target message M that you want to open uh, this particular signature to, and you want to create a short hint for it. For it. So the hint you can sort of, set, uh, sort of set to be, it could be the product of all the hashed messages except the target message. And you can efficiently compute this because this is just in the base of the RSM modules. And now the idea is that given this, you can perform this local verification check to be sigma hat raised to the power E is equal to be H, the hint, times the hash of the target message. And that's how we can potentially verify. And now everybody must be thinking, okay, all is good. It seems like by just performing this pre-processing, we can efficiently make sure that local verification can be done. But there's a big problem here. And the problem is that this is totally insecure because the hint can be adversarial. The adversity can create any arbitrary hint and there is no structure that we are enforcing or we can even check because we don't have all the messages that were signed because the messages are lost. Once you sort of just generate this hint, I can't have access to those particular messages because that's the whole point. And for example, consider H to be one over H of M and Sigma had to be one. That's basically a valid forgery on this particular scheme. So it seems like maybe it's unclear how to sort of aggregate signatures using this RSA landscape, but what can we do? Now, our observation is that the issue, the issue that we are facing here is that the hint that we are generating in this case, it's just product of all these hash value of these messages. It's totally unstructured. And we cannot ensure well-formedness of the hint anyhow, without sort of just reading through all the other messages. Now, how to get around this problem? The idea that we employ is that we're going to sort of just yeah, switch the base and the exponent. We're going to move the messages to the exponent and sort of just keep, in a way, the, the RSA part on the messages rather than on just like a fixed exponent. And what I mean by that is, so consider the following scheme. In this, the verification keys contains, again, an RSA modulus and some base element G. And a signature now is the H of mth root of G. G is part of the verification key. And to verify this particular signature, you just raise the, uh, the signature to H of M and you match it to be the element G that was present in the digital signatures. And this is basically the Gennaro, Halevi, and Rosario's uh, 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 signature scheme that was sort of defined in the late 90s. And that has been the basis of many other uh, interesting signature schemes. So the idea is that the structure or the, the inversion is happening on, on um, it's not happening on a fixed prime, but on a prime that depends upon the message. Now, let's see how we can potentially verify this or locally aggregate this or simply just aggregate this. Again, if we have the sequence of messages, M1 up till ML and their corresponding signatures, G raised to the power one over H of M1 up till one over H of ML. The idea is that again, multiply all of them. That's going to be an aggregate signature. And to verify this aggregate signature, what you're going to do now is that you're going to raise sigma hat, the aggregate signature, to all the hashed messages, not just one prime, all these particular hashed messages. And you're going to check that it equals the, uh, a product of L terms. And each of these L terms is itself G raised to the power all but one particular uh, hashed message. So you basically omit one particular hashed message because there is one over H of MI in that particular right-hand side on the top part. So it seems like hopefully you understand that completeness of the scheme, of this aggregate signature scheme does follow. 
Now the question remains that can we, we have made this switch, we have made sure that the structure of uh, this thing is switched, it's in the exponent. Can we use this to make sure that we can come up with a locally verifiable aggregate signature scheme? Can we generate efficient hints for it? And it turns out, yes, we actually can. So, and yeah, I forgot to mention this, but I'm assuming for simplicity that H of M is always a prime and we can handle this by sort of very well-known techniques. I'll, but I'll refer uh, uh, that to later. So let's just see how to sort of potentially uh, generate a hint. Suppose I want to generate the hint for the first message M1. Now the idea is going to be the verifier simply checks this particular equation. I'm going to use a notation that H of I is equal to the hash of the message M I. Now I'm going to write uh, rewrite the left-hand side as all the hash values except the first hash value. So sigma hat raised to the power H2, H3 up till HL and H1 on the outside. outside. And similarly, I'm going to divide the right-hand side into two components. One that depends upon, uh, that does not depend upon H1. The other one, it depends upon H1 and the remaining terms. And now the idea is that, so for example, consider that uh, L is equal to four. Then in that case, this basically simply means that the equation is that sigma hat raised to the power H2, H3, H4, and H1 is equal to be uh, G times H2, H3, H4, and G times H2, H3 plus H2, H4, H3, H4 raised to the power H1. So that's basically the verification check that we are performing. Now, the point is, if you sort of just focus in on these circled components, you look at the product of HIs here, here and the sum product of HIs. Then these terms do not depend upon H1, they depend upon the remaining messages. And this is what we can pre-compute and set it to by a hint, because during the hint generation process, we know all the messages. So we can generate these hashes and we can sort of just perform the simple arithmetic operation. The idea is that this is basically going to be our hint for this particular message M1. Now to verify this local, uh, or just to verify this particular message uh, for the aggregate signature, you're going to simply sort of check the following equation that sigma hat raised to the power the first element of the uh, hint value times uh, H1 is equal to GA times GB raised to the power H1. That basically substitutes these circle values with A and B in this particular equation. So it means that we are able to get uh, these uh, simple property that we can efficiently verify this. And the intuition behind security is that you can simply rewrite the equation on the right-hand side as follows. You can move all the H1 dependent components on the left side, and you can rewrite it as follows that sigma hat to the A divided by GB raised to the power H1 is equal to GA. And it turns out now you basically use the fact that if adversary finds a forgery sigma hat such that this is satisfied, then in that case, I can use that to find the H1 through of a known element because G is like a known element. We can sort of just use some clever algebra to make sure that we can sort of just create a forgery out of it, create like uh, the RSA challenge out of this. So it seems like, great, everything seems to work. We have generated hints. We have kind of argued how security might hold, but it turns out if you look a little more closely, then it's very simple, but it's flawed. And the reason it's flawed is that the hints are very large and the hints are large because uh, we don't know what phi of n is. And uh, because phi of n guarantees what security is and phi of n is required to reduce the elements in the exponent. Without knowing phi of n, we have to compute these as integers and integers multiplying these n integers or L integers, that's going to be O of L bits. That's pretty large. So it seems like we are back to square one. We performed some processing, but again, we could not sort of just solve this. But to this end, sort of just one very simple trick or just the well-known Shamish trick came to our savior. So it's just uh, what Shamish trick says, it says given elements X, Y, alpha, and beta, such that X, A, X to the alpha is equal to Y to the beta and alpha and beta are co-prime. There is a way to efficiently find the alpha root of Y. So now we can use this Shamish trick over here and sort of simply rewrite this particular equation so that again, we can put H1 related components on the left-hand side, H1 independent components on the right-hand side, I can say this is going to be my X. This is going to be my beta. That's going to be the alpha. That's going to be the Y. So I can generate G raised to the power one over H1 using Shami's trick in this particular way. And that's basically my hint. And to verify this particular hint, you can sort of just here raise it again to H1 and that's going to be equal to G. And if that's true, then you can verify the signature. But if you fo focus a little more, you might imagine that this, you might sort of just uh, understand that this particular hint has a wonderful property. That it's not just a hint that you can use to verify. The hint is actually the signature for this particular message M1. 
So it turns out this scheme has a wonderful property that not only we can compress signatures, but we can perfectly decompress all the signatures. Typically, whenever we think of cryptographic compression, we lose information. Here we are observing not only we can compress, but we can perfectly decompress. So just really the magic of number three at play, where we can sort of perform local verification, but also recompute the original signature entirely. And just trying to sum up quickly about locally verifiable aggregate signatures, the main technical tool is that we ensure this well-formedness can be automatically performed in the exponent without uh, us doing anything. Because some, at a very high level, what's happening is that if you write the Chinese name in the theorem sort of terms in the exponent, then they're going to sort of align very well, and they're not going to intersect with different terms. And that's going to really help us. But what's very cute about this construction is that the hint generation tells us that we can perfectly uncompute or create the actual ag original signature from aggregate signatures. And this is the number theory magic at play. And uh, one thing that I was sort of just yeah, hiding on the rug, which was this how to sample, how to hash messages in a deterministic way to primes. But we can rely on sort of just known techniques due to Mikali Rabin and Wadhan and four lobes, where they sort of just use these techniques in the literature of verifiable random functions. But we can use those ideas to prove security in the static setting or also in the full security in the random oracle setting. So just trying to summarize, we gave new constructions from RSA and pairings. And although I won't have time to tell you that uh, how to get it from pairings, but there's a kind of interesting uh, comparison or like a juxtaposition that you can do for these techniques. And I'd be happy to talk about that later. But let me sort of just try to summarize that in this work, we sort of introduced the concept of local verification for aggregate signatures, circumventing and defining that there is an impossibility we can sidestep it. And this still lets us new applications and sort of just interesting space-time trade-offs. And next, we also sort of show how to develop these new algebraic techniques, which unlock this amazing property about RSA-based signatures, which was not known before, that we can not only compress information, but also perfectly decompress it, which seems fascinating to us. It'd be happy to sort of just yeah, understand that why it's, re I mean, it's happening, the math works out, but it's really, it's bizarre and also sort of just really fun. And I forgot to mention, but the pairing-based signatures that we came up with, they also have interesting properties that the openings are fully public. You don't need the signature even to sort of come up with the opening. It can be performed in a totally offline phase. And we gave a result about feasibility from Snarks. And also, I didn't get to mention, but it's in the paper and I'd be happy to talk about later, that we also show that we can extend the aggregation concept to secret to encryption systems as well, where multi-user encryption systems. And sort of this sort of just leads to many interesting questions that can be come up with more applications of these algebraic techniques? Or can we sort of just yeah, come up with these general model, uh, general model solution for locally verifiable aggregate signatures? And even can we study the concept of aggregation beyond IBE for which we have interesting results or other non-encryption based systems? And yeah, so thank you so much and be happy to take any questions, but I think we are out of time for questions. So if there's any quick questions, please come up to the front to the microphones. Yeah, so I guess a quick question. I, I assume since you didn't call this talk de-aggregatable signatures, the pairing-based construction isn't as nice as the RSA construction. Uh, do, do you think it's possible, though, to come up with a pairing-based system where you can recover the original signature? OK, so in case, uh, hopefully everybody sort of just heard the question. It's a great question. Can you get uh, the perfect decompression property out of anything else other than uh, yeah factoring based assumptions. I've been thinking about it. I don't know yet. I, I can't answer this because I don't know. That's the, that's the short answer. It'd be wonderful if we can do it. Uh, you can probably throw a bunch of assumptions, but just purely doing from bilinear maps, I don't see it right away. Maybe something could be done. That'd be very fascinating too, but I don't know right now how to do it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question again. Hello. I'm a bit puzzled by the incompressibility argument that you, you presented, because when you have a signature, you have many messages for which the signature is valid, in, uh, including the one you're looking for. So in, uh, when you, you have exhaustive search, you will find many other messages. So it doesn't really uh, decompress. Uh, do you mean the incompressibility argument is uh, doesn't guarantee that you can extract all the signatures correctly? Is that the question? So uh, in the incompressibility argument you presented, you say that from the uh, aggregate signature, uh, you should be able to uh, uncompress all the message, all the messages which have been signed by exhaustive search. But if you do so, you will have a much bigger set. So you won't you won't have the original set of messages. So it's not really decompressing. So I, I wonder if this uh, argument has been formally proven that you cannot have uh, any uh, locally verifiable aggregate signature or 
Is there any other things? Okay, that I understand missing? the question. Okay, let me uh, please clarify in case I'm not misunderstanding the question. The question is that typically I'm assuming that the messages that the, the 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 set of messages for which we are trying to sort of just locally aggregate them that is a priori known and that's a fixed size set for which you can kind of over basically do like a brute force search and sort of just come up with the this testing operation but if the message set is exponential size uh, in that case how to sort of just make sure that you can potentially sort of just here yeah, follow the same uh, incompressibility argument is that the question so i wonder if the argument that you presented is formally proven yeah, it is formally for one. Yeah, yeah, it's in the paper. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about it later, but yeah, it, it is formally for one. All right, let's thank the speaker again. So, next up is a talk about multi model private signatures. This is a work by Koa Nguyen, Huhun Wuo, Willy Susilo, and Guomin Yang. And uh, unfortunately, the speaker couldn't be here. It's Koa Nguyen. And we're going to run a video of his presentation. And I see Kevin has already set up the video. So I guess, I guess Kevin, you can get it rolling. Oh. Hello, Wait. everyone. I am Kwang Nguyen from the University of Wollongong, right. Australia. Today, I am going to talk about a new approach to address the tension between privacy and accountability. Can you, can you please wait up a second? Hold on a second. Authentication. On Zoom, can you please hold up? Thank you. Okay, now you can return. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Kwang Nguyen from the University of Wollongong, Australia. Today, I am going to talk about a new approach to address the tension between privacy and accountability in multi-user authentication systems. This is a try work with my colleagues at the University of Wollongong, Hu Chung Kuo, Willy Sushilo, and Wu Min Yang. We call our new cryptographic primitive multi-model private signatures. Here in the plan of my talk, first I will discuss several prominent examples of previous multi-user signature systems with privacy and accountability features and our observation regarding their shortcomings. Then I will demonstrate how our new primitive can address these shortcomings. Next, I will sketch our definitions and constructions for multi-model private signatures. Finally, I will list several interesting questions that we left open. Let us first consider the setting of print signatures, one of the most well-known private signature systems. We have a group of users. Each user has a secret signing key, which can be used to sign messages in an anonymous manner. Here, signer with personal identifiable information ID can issue a signature on any message in a way such that the signature verifiers can be convinced that a signature was from someone in the group but cannot determine who is the actual signer. Here, ring signature provides absolute privacy for signers. Absolute anonymity could be a nice feature that protects the users in certain situations, such as whistle blowing. However, it can also be abused for unethical or illegal purposes. Therefore, it could be desirable to restrict the excessive anonymity of users in ring signatures. In fact, there have been several attempts such as linkable ring signatures or traceable ring signatures. However, the linking and tracing mechanisms in the system can only be activated if the signer in questions has generated at least two signatures. If a malicious signer only issued one controversial signature and then went offline forever, then it can avoid 
accountability. If we look for a primitive offering both anonymity and accountability, then the most well-known example is group signature. In group signature, we have an opening authority whose secret key can be used to trace any valid signature and recover the identity of the signer. This authority is supposed to take action only in case of disputes. But wait, if this authority is corrupted, then it can open all signatures at will. And in that case, there is essentially no privacy for users. There have been several attempts to restrict the power of the opening authority in group signatures, such as traceable signatures, group signatures with message dependent opening, or accountable tracing signatures. However, in this system, there is always a party who can break signer's privacy without any consent. So, on the one hand, we have ring signature and variants that give too much privilege for users. On the other hand, we have group signatures and variants that provide too much power for the authorities. Finding a solution that is reasonably fair for both users and authorities, a solution that balances privacy and accountability was a challenging problem for a long time. A new approach towards solving this tension was proposed last year at Eurocrypt in a work by Libet, myself, Beters, and you. We introduced bifurcated anonymous signatures, or BIAS for short, which can be seen as a hybrid of ring signatures and group signatures. More precisely, a given bias could be traceable or non-traceable, depending on a predicate bit P computed by the signer before signing. If P is E zero, then the signature is non-traceable, and the authority can learn nothing about ID, as in ring signature. If P is 1, then the signature is traceable and the authority can recover ID, as in group signatures. Since the user knows P in advance, it can control its privacy and accountability. In the traceable case, it can decide whether to sign the given message or not. On the other hand, the authority can also ensure that signers of all traceable signatures will be kept accountable. So, BIAS seems to have provided a nice solution to the tension between privacy and accountability. However, there are still problems. There is, in fact, a crucial disadvantage of BIAS, of group signatures, and all similar proposals. We observe that accountability in these systems is realized via a total tracing procedure during which the whole identity of the trace users must be disclosed to the authorities. This level of accountability is indeed a serious violation of users' privacy. Why privacy? can be a very complicated notion. In its purest sense, it can be defined as the right of an individual to control which piece of information about herself or himself can be disclosed. Furthermore, in many real-life situations, it is not necessarily the highest priority for authorities to perform a total tracing. For instance, the authorities could only be interested in learning whether an anonymous user is over 18 years old, or works in a given organization, or lives in a particular area, or has an annual income exceeding certain threshold. 
all has been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, etc. This observation motivated us to consider systems in which users and authorities have certain agreement on which piece of information can possibly be disclosed for each signature. Our proposal can be summarized as follows. When setting up a system, we specify a list of signing functions and a list of K disclosing functions denoted by G1, G2, and so on to GK, where K is a positive integer. If user ID wants to sign message M with respect to a signing function F, then it first computes F of M, W, and ID, where W is an auxiliary information that we call a witness. It serves as an evidence for the signability of the tuple M, W, and ID. The value of F is an integer between 0 and K. If it is 0, then M cannot be signed and the user abort. Otherwise, when F is non zero, the user can generate a valid signature that is anonymous to everyone but the opening authority. So, what the opening authority can learn then? If F is equal to 1, then it can learn the function G1 of ID and nothing else. If f is j for some integer j, then it can learn the function gj of id and nothing else. The value of f indeed determines which disclosing function will be activated. Looking back, our proposal captures ring signatures, group signatures, and bias as special cases. Ring and group signatures correspond to the case of a single disclosing function. For ring signatures, it is the euro function. For group signatures, it is the identity function. Meanwhile, bias corresponds to the case of two disclosing functions, the euro function and the identity function. As an example of application, let us consider the scenario where we have anonymous financial transactions, each has a hidden amount of money, such as in the privacy preserving cryptocurrency system Monero. The authority, for instance, can regulate the system as follows. When an amount less than 100, the transaction will be anonymous to everyone, including the authority. However, when the amount is between 100 and 1000, the authority will be able to learn the country of the sender. When the amount is between 1000 and 10,000, the authority can identify the country and the organization of the sender. Finally, for an amount at least 10,000, then the full identity of the sender can be traced. In other words, we can have a fine grained accountability feature. Depending on the underlying transaction amounts, the authority can learn different pieces of information about the sender. Now, let me summarize our contributions. First, we propose the concept of multimodal private signatures, or MPS, which is a new approach for addressing the tension between privacy and accountability in multi-user signature systems. Signatures in MPS are anonymous to everyone except the opening authority who can learn some special information of the user identity. That piece of information can be defined in a flexible and fine-grained manner based on a set of disclosing functions. Privacy is naturally achieved in MPS because signer can decide which piece of personal information can be disclosed. Accountability is also achieved 
since the authority can learn the desirable information if needed. Next, we provide rigorous definitions for MPS. This step is quite exciting and is not straightforward at all. We would like to make our definitions as general as possible by capturing not only the privacy and accountability of green group and biased natures, but also the five grand controls on who can sign which message, as in attribute-based, policy-based, and functional signatures. It is also worth highlighting that the privacy definitions for MPS is quite involved since we have to address the case where the opening authority is fully corrupted. This level of privacy is impossible to achieve in ordinary group signatures. We provide a generic and modular construction of MPS for arbitrary functions based on commonly used cryptographic building blocks. Our construction can be instantiated in the standard model from pairings. We also obtain a concrete latent based construction in the random oracle model. Regarding security of MPS, we require two main properties, privacy and enforceability. Privacy roughly ensures that each party in the system can only learn the piece of signer's information which the signer intends to disclose. There are, in fact, two notions of privacy that we should consider. First, without the OA secret key, it should be infeasible for everyone to learn anything about the signer's private information. Second, even a fully corrupted OA cannot learn anything beyond the value TJ of ID. This is a very strong requirement indeed. Enforceability captures several requirements. First, it should be infeasible to generate a valid signature with respect to a double MW ID which is not signable. Second, it should also be infeasible to mislead the signature opening. And third, no one, even a coalition of corrupted group manager and corrupted opening authority, can issue signatures on behalf of an honest user. The second and the third requirements, in fact, resemble the notions of full traceability and non frameability in dynamic group signatures. In terms of constructions, we obtain a generic construction of MPS for arbitrary signing functions and arbitrary disclosing functions. The construction relies on commonly used cryptographic building blocks, namely ordinary digital signatures, CCA secure public encryption, and non interactive neuronal proof for general statements. As a feasibility result, the construction can be realized in the standard model from pairings. Uh, via the Roth Ostrovsky Sahai proof system and from lattices via the Piker Sahan proof system. Our construction follows the size and encrypt and proof paradigm, which is typically used for designing group signatures. The group manager certifies the membership by signing the user's identity. When issuing a signature, the user encrypts something and prove well firmness of ciphertext as well as knowledge of a valid membership certificate. Note that in group signature, user typically encrypts its full identity ID. In bias, the ciphertext contains either ID or euro. Here, the main difference is that the ciphertext contains exactly what needs to be disclosed. Proving well firmness of such a subtech in zero knowledge is the most involved step of the construction. As illustrations, we instantiate the system with concrete signing and disclosing functions, the correct evaluation of which can be efficiently proved in zero knowledge. We obtain a parent based construction in the standard model as well as a latent based scheme in the random model core model that potentially enjoys both quantum security. 
to be more specific in both instantiations we consider the setting with a single signing function f and four disclosing functions we let message m be a commitment to witness w and define function f based on integer ranges this is to capture our motivating example about anonymous financial transactions with hidden amounts we also consider this closing function as linear transformation of id which are sufficient for many applications the pairing base and latter base construction follow the same paradigms as the generic construction but we employ some of uh, the ded dedicated building blocks for efficiency reasons specifically the bearing base scheme employs be the same commitment a structure preserving signature by queen that's all the bonnet signature uh, tap based bke by uh, kings and the gross high proofs meanwhile uh, the lab based scheme use the kdx commitment a signature scheme with efficient protocols by libertator a CCSQ PKE obtained from the GBV IBE and the CSK transformation and the stern like uh, unit you know, argument systems. Finally, as the first work on multi model private signature, we do not expect to provide a thoroughly, uh, a thorough study of this primitive. We leave several interesting open questions for future investigations the first question is to construct practically usable mps schemes which express expressive signing and disclosing disclosing functions designing efficient mps schemes with both quantum security is also a fascinating question note that our proposed pairing base and latter base construction do capture quite expressive functions but are not purely efficient from the theoretical perspective it is worth studying the connections between mps and other advanced primitives like functional encryption in fact the idea that decryption reveals a function of the identity is closely related to the spirit of functional encryption However, so far we have been unable to obtain a construction of MPS based on uh, functional encryption. Another appealing question is to equip MPS with additional functionalities such as verifiable opening or user revocations. And let me conclude my presentation here. Thank you for your attention. I am happy to answer your questions either online after the talk or via emails. Thank you. Okay, I think Q&A will be very short. In case you have any question, you can contact the authors by email and you, I guess you are able to find the email in the paper and send your questions there. All right, so this brings us to the final presentation of the session. So the title of the paper is Pi Cut Shoe and Friends, Compact Blind Signatures via Parallel Instance Cut and Shoes and More. And this is a paper by Rucha Ton, Charatana Alperom, Lucian Hanslik, Julian Loss, Anja, Anna Lusanskaya, and Benedict Wagner. And we'll have actually two presenters. Benedict and Ruchaton will present the work together. Slides are there. You can see the slides in Zoom as well.
It's like running a video. So a quick view of the talk in backward direction. And now it's forward. Now we're good to go. Uh, uh, hello, hello. Okay. Hello. Um, so today uh, we're going to present uh, Pikachu and Friends Compact Line Signatures via Parallel Instance Cut and Choose and More. Um, this work is a joint work with Lucian, Julian, Anna, and Benedict. Um, Lucian, Julian, and Benedict are from CISPA, and Anna and I are from Brown. Um, today, the talk is going to be split into two parts. The first part, I'll talk about it, and the second part, Benedict will present it. Uh, so first, uh, what are blind signatures? Um, blind signatures introduced by David Chom um, is a cryptographic protocol, in, including a signer and a user. The signer controls the secret key, while the user has a message that it wants to be signed without the signer knowing the message. At the end, the user will receive a signature. So why do we care about blind signatures? It's because there are applications such as an um, unlinkable payment system, electronic cash, and also voting. Our goal here is to um, get a blind signature construction that have efficient parameters. Um, these comes in the form the form of um, uh, the signature size and also the communication complexity. Uh, so what security properties do we want for blind signatures? The first one is called blindness. Um, here, um, an adversarial signer, um, when interacts with users, and even if it at the end it sees the message and signature pairs, the signers can still can still not um, link these message and signature pairs back to which protocol execution it, it was from. Um, the second security is a un unforgeability property. Uh, in particular, uh, one more unforgeability. Um, so here we have an adversarial user interacting with the signer. Um, the user can interleave the protocol executions as, as it wants and then after some number of signing sessions is completed, the user cannot learn more than that number of message and signature pairs. Um, note here that um, here you don't want to use a normally used unforgeability definition because uh, because of the blindness property and the challenger does not know if uh, a new message and signature pair outputted is a new one or not. Um, so. What are the state of the art for blind signatures? In the random oracle model where our work is also based on, uh, there are many efficient constructions. Uh, however, some of them uh, uses non-standard assumptions such as interactive assumptions. Uh, for example, one more discrete law or something like that. Um, some others efficient constructions uh, does not support polynomial number of signatures. Uh, in particular, um, their security guarantee only allow logarithmic number of signatures to be issued. And there are also works that, although it's not that efficient, but supports polynomial number of signatures and also uses standard assumptions. The goal is to find um, a construction that is efficient, uh, supports polynomial number of signatures, and also um, utilizes standard assumptions. Uh, and now before we go into our, into our work, um, we'll introduce the work uh, that our work's based on. Uh, we call it the boosting transform. So from the state of the art slide before, uh, there are deep signatures that are secure only when you issue logarithmic number of signatures. Uh, we'll focus on a certain class called the linear blind signatures which is a three move blind signatures as this one. Um, so from last year, HGCrypt, uh, Katz, Laws, and Rosenberg uh, introduced a boosting transform that transformed these linear blind signatures into a, one, a blind signature that supports polynomial number of signatures to be issued. Uh, the technique used here is one out of n cut and choose in the nth interaction. Um, so why does uh, so why does this transform work? Um, one of the properties of linear blind signature is that uh, the reduction or the signer can simulate the signing protocol without using the key uh, if it knows the message and randomness that the user is using. 
And here, when you do cut and choose, um, the user has to commit the randomness and the messages in, that it's going to be using in the protocol, sends it to the signer. And in this case, in the random Oracle model, the reduction can extract these randomness and messages from the random Oracle and then use them to simulate the signing protocol. And you might wonder why we, we have to use this. It's because the linear blind signature only supports logarithmic numbers. Issue, hello, hello, sorry. Um, and that means that for, for us, for this, for the construction to support polynomial number of signatures, um, we have to, a lot of those signatures to be outputted in the reduction has to comes without using the secret key. And here I'll outline what the boosting transform does. Uh, in the nth interaction, the signer just sends um, a number and saying that here we're doing one out of n cut and choose the user. Then the user commits its randomness, sends back to the signer. Then they interact and in, end in the underlying linear blind signature protocol. And then the signer picks one of these and protocol execution, and then the user opens the randomness that it commits before for all but the selected session, and then they complete the protocol. Uh, you can see that there are these steps that takes um, communication complexity with linear dependency on N, and this is um, inefficient. So for our results, um, we use the same technique uh, and get the same result as the boosting transform, but we have a communication complexity with um, logarithmic dependency on N. And so uh, from the boosting transform, what we do is that uh, these four steps here, oops. Oh, okay. <laughs> these four steps here, um, we made changes to them so that the communication complexity is reduced. Um, for the first one, we just, for the end commitments, we just commit them using a random oracle into one commitment and sends them from the user to the signer. The same is for, for these challenges in the third part here. And then for the first messages sent from the signer to the user, um, we have the signer only, only generate log n of them and let the user derive um, n of them from there. Uh, so what about the last step of opening the commitment? Um, so here we use a cryptographic primitive called punctuable pseudo random function or PPR uh, from Sahai and Waters in 2014. Um, here we use the seed and then use the PPR to generate n pseudo random values. We can reveal some of these and the rest are still hidden. However, um, in random Oracle model, we can uh, instantiate the PPR of using the random Oracle and the GGM3 construction. And when we review the values, we can get the communication to log n times the number of non-revealed values. And here, to apply this to the cut and choose transform, um, so at first we can use the PBRF to generate the randomness. And since we review all but one of the selected session, uh, here um, we only have log communication and we reduce the communication complexity. And the next part, Benedict can take over. Thanks. So, uh... Yeah, I will present the second part of, of this talk. Um, so Champ showed you this, this generic transform that, that we have um, from a logarithmically secure linear blind signature scheme to a fully secure blind signature scheme. And it is efficient in terms of signature sizes. In fact, it was before we started and our new version of it is now also efficient in terms of communication. Um, the problem is that if we want to put this to practice, there are still a lot of challenges for us to solve. Let me let me uh, show you why. So the first challenge is, okay, there's a 
gigantic security loss from the underlying assumption to this linear blind signature scheme. And this is actually inherited uh, in our fully secure scheme. Okay, so the second problem that we have is that the concrete communication complexity, uh, while it depends logarithmic on this parameter n, the coefficient uh, associated to this term depends on the assumption. I will explain why this is the case uh, in a minute. But in combination, these two lead to very inefficient concrete parameters. So we did some example calculation for the case of a Schnorr instantiation. And in fact, if you want to support two to the 30 signatures, then you need to use a 12,000 bit size group, which is clearly impractical. Okay, so uh, let's look at this communication uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, where do we start from actually? So Champ mentioned we start with this linear blind signature scheme where we have this three message flow. We send some R, get a challenge C, send a message S. And this R is uh, the image of some lowercase r under a linear function. For example, exponentiation in a, in a cyclic group. And now when we do this boosting transform, we have to send in our new version logarithmic number of these R's uh, from the signer to the user. And uh, of course, the size of one R depends on the assumption. Okay, so this is the problem for our communication. So why don't we just drop this first message and go to a two round scheme? So in this case, we use uh, BLS. Um, you will see why uh, in a few slides, just trust me now that this is a good choice. You don't have to understand all these details if you don't know the scheme already. What is important for us is that we check uh, if we can still apply this boosting transform, right? So for the boosting transform, we need essentially two properties. The first one, Champ already mentioned this, is uh, we call it property star because it's important. Um, you can simulate the signer side without having the secret key as soon as you know the mes message and the randomness, okay? Um, you can do that by programming the random oracle. And the second property is logarithmic security. Okay, so for blind BLS, we still have the first property. You can just, uh, if you know the message, you can, and the alpha, you can cancel out the alpha and use the standard way of uh, simulating BLS signatures. Okay, but the problem is the second property, because for this scheme, if we want to rely on non-interactive assumptions, then we only have key-only security. So to recall in a signature scheme, key-only security means that the adversary does not have access to a signing oracle um, and only to the public key. Okay, so um, this means that we need to understand how we can change our boosting transform to support key-only security, right? Because now it only supports logarithmic security. For that, we introduced this new technique, parallel instance cut and choose, or for short, Pikachu. And to understand it, we need to first understand how does the original boosting transform by Katz, Loss, and Rosenberg works. Um, so let me, let me tell you that. So we consider a signer and a user, or in a security proof, a signer oracle and the adversary. And what they do is they run these N sessions of the underlying blind signature scheme. And then one of them is chosen at random. And this one is completed while the other ones are opened. And by open, I mean that the user sends his message and randomness that he used and that he committed to before uh, to the signer. Okay, so now we will look at these sessions and distinguish between malformed sessions and honest sessions. So what is a malformed session? By that, I mean that the adversary um, commit, did not honestly commit to his message and randomness or he computed the challenge in a, in a malicious way. Okay, so let's say the adversary malforms two or more uh, of these sessions, then as he has to open all but one of them, we never need to provide a response because the signer will abort, right? The, the adversary will get caught. Okay, so that's good for our reduction. We don't need a secret key because we don't need to provide a response. The second good case is where he is just honest. He commits to uh, all of his randomness and uh, messages honestly. And then we can actually extract using the random oracle because we use some uh, random oracle based commitments and then use this cool property star because now we have the message and the randomness to simulate without the secret key. Okay, 
The tricky case is if he cheats in exactly one session, because in this case, we could hit this session with our cut and choose index. And uh, then we actually need to ask the signer oracle of the underlying um, blind signature scheme because we don't have a secret key. Okay, so this happens with probability one over n. And let's see what that means for the entire experiment. So in each interaction, it happens with probability one over n, such a successful cheat. And um, as the, the, this parameter n grows over time, we can sum this up and see that the expectation of number of cheats, so this is also the expected number of times we have to call our signing oracle of the underlying scheme is logarithmic. And this is why, uh, why it works for logarithmically secure schemes. But keep in mind that we want to use it for a key-only secure scheme now. So we are not allowed to query a logarithmic number of times. We have to get this down to zero. OK, so how do we do that? Our first trick is to scale everything, right? Just take some constant, scale everything. Um, and then we, the, the expectation also scales, so we get it down to less than 1. This is already good. But now for security, we don't need in expectation anything. We need it with overwhelming probability. But the uh, concentration bound will only give us a constant probability. So what can we do? We can just repeat everything in parallel with independent keys and independent randomness. Okay, And that means that um, with overwhelming probability, there's one of these instances, one of the keys, for which in the entire experiment, the adversary never cheats successfully. And that means we never need to ask the signer oracle for this key. So what we can do, we can just guess this, this instance I star, embed the key of the underlying BLS fine signature scheme there, and then um, we don't need the signer oracle. Okay, so that's good. But now you may ask, hmm, this guy, he's talking about concrete efficiency and now, he blows up everything by a factor of k. So this, is, this seems to be not efficient. And uh, this is why we use blind BLS, actually. Because for BLS, we can use a lot of techniques from aggregation. We heard about aggregation in the first talk. We can aggregate, for example, the responses, the signatures, and so on. And essentially, this cut and choose uh, over multiple instances comes almost for free now. OK. So that brings me to an overview of our concrete schemes. We have one concrete scheme that I didn't show you, which is based on the RSA assumption. So we instantiate this framework from the RSA assumption and to improve uh, the communication and signature sizes, we use some RSA specific optimizations. Um, and the second one, this is the one I explained uh, at a high level, is the one from the key only secure BLS scheme which is based on the CDH assumption. For that, we use the parallel instance cut and choose technique and these uh, aggregation optimizations to get a fully secure blind signature scheme. OK, so to wrap up our talk, what have we learned? We have a generic result. This is what Jam showed you, where we take this cuts loss Rosenberg boosting transform, and we go from uh, linear communication in the number of interactions to uh, to logarithmic communication, okay? And then for concrete parameters, we constructed two, uh, two schemes that use these ideas, one from the RSA, one from the CDH assumption, and we uh, actually take the security loss into account to estimate concrete parameter sizes, um, which I think are rather practical. Okay, so that's it. This was fun, thank you. Thanks. Any questions? Please come to the microphone. Hey, thank you. Uh, so one quick question for your last uh, for the evaluation. Can you tell us something? Have you benchmarked the the signer performance for that? Uh, no, okay. we actually didn't look at uh, computation. Okay. We only looked at uh, communication and signature sizes. Okay. But uh, yeah, I expect that the signer com computation is okayish. The the user. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so there's still this parameter n, right? right, right. And the comput computation is still linear in this parameter. Right, right. And so, so does this depend on n? And what, what did you set n to? Uh, 
what what does it i mean what is a reasonable n you have in mind i guess for oh okay for, for so so this this n is the is like a, this the counter that the signer increases in every interaction right, right but what is a reasonable upper bound you expect for to, to achieve like oh i see so like for so for these for these sizes we uh we take the maximum to be uh two to the 30. okay yeah right. thanks uh, thanks to both of you for the very interesting talk. So I have a question about this boosting transform. So you run many instances of this base uh, line signature scheme, but then you open a bunch of them. Yeah, that's a yes. great slide. Um, and I'm worried that when you open one of them, it reveals the, the client's message, which is supposed to be kept secret. So I'm wondering how that yes. is resolved. It's a good question. I mean, uh, the, the trick is that you, instead of using the message itself, you use commitments. To the message in, in independent commitments in each of these instances and then uh, this the commitment that you use here is not revealed and uh, and you here you you actually only reveal the commitments that go into the underlying scheme so okay so i should think of this as you're doing a blind signature on a commitment of a message yeah but you can include the commitment randomness in the final signature then it's a yeah thank you good question all right so I don't see any questions in the Zoom. So let's thank the speakers again. So this concludes this session. Now we have a short break and the sessions will continue at 10 a.m.